and uh, I would like to call the panelists. We have Dr. G. R. who taught about to taught us about coronary artery disease and the pathophysiology. He's a cardiologist and head of preventive cardiology at PSG Medical College, Coimbatore. The next we have is uh, Dr. Suresh Bagia. Uh, he's from Ahmedabad. He's again a preventive cardiologist. Dr. Suresh Bhagya is a cardiovascular surgeon. Uh, he has his practice at Ahmedabad as well as Baroda. He is working on preventive cardiology. Uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Sharang again on the panel. Dr. Dharmendra Panchal. Uh, Dr. Dharmendra Panchal is a diabetes and an endocrine specialist. Dr. Manisha Shah. Dr. Manisha is working on prevention and reversal of diabetes. She is based in Ahmedabad. Dr. Shefali Gupta. We have heard Dr. Shefali Gupta in the introduction. She is Senior Director, Lab Services. She is a passionate lifestyle medicine physician and co-author of uh, Mind Sutra. Dr. Neetu Parikh. Dr. Neetu Parikh is a consultant physician. She specializes in uh, lifestyle modification, including diet for metabolic diseases. Dr. Glory. Is Dr. Glory here? I think she is not here. Uh, Dr. Kaushal. Dr. Kaushal is a gastroenterologist based in Ahmedabad. Dr. Akash Kankar. Is Dr. Akash here? And Dr. Amit Gupta, he is a pediatrician based in Ahmedabad. I would like to give an introduction for Dr. Varsha Shah. Dr. Var we heard her uh, in the beginning of the session. Dr. Varsha Shah is a pediatrician. She is based in uh, Vadodara and she has keen interest in lifestyle medicine and she helps uh, young children and adolescents reverse lifestyle disorders with lifestyle modification. I would uh, now like to introduce Dr. Arti. Dr. Arti is a clinical cardiologist who works in Baroda and she is a geriatrician and a lifestyle physician. She's completed her IBLM uh, and she's a very passionate uh, doctor who works on uh, reducing medications, that is, deep prescription. I would like to also invite Dr. Ashwat Kumar for the panel discussion. He's a PhD in yoga. He's a national level athlete. He's the first vegan bodybuilder of India to win two silver medals for our country. So now the first question goes to Dr. G R. Uh, as the audience, you know, uh, we all love to listen to stories and we all missed out a story. So we'll listen to the story from Dr. G.R. as to uh, about disease reversal and whether atherosclerosis can be reversed or not. Um, good that the chefs have not reported, so I thought I'll join this uh, session again. So. As I told you, I changed the entire lot of slides just to make things interesting for myself and my colleagues who have already attended. That's why I thought we'll take up this question. Um, <clears throat> have you all heard of the story of North Carolia? Has anyone heard about North Carolia? So North Carolia is a small place in Finland. Okay, their uh, fishing is a hobby. Even hunting is a hobby. Even now, for the visitors, when you go there as a tourist, you will be allowed to do all those things. Berry picking is another one. Okay. In so in 1970s, people were dying of uh, heart disease and that too of uh, youngsters. <coughs> that was a leading country with uh, mortality. Okay. So what happened was the people lodged a complaint. Okay. So I do not know whether uh, any such activism will happen in India. 
but they posted a complaint to the government, petition to the government, and the government responded immediately. That is, uh, the best part was that uh, if it is to happen in a country like ours, somebody, uh, a retired professor would have been made as uh, uh, lead. Okay, what, what happened was they got in a person called Pushka who was in his 30s, who was in public health. They knew that atherosclerosis is a long-term process and they have to invest on a person who is going to live that long. So it was Pushka who was selected. And so, jokingly, these people used to say his, he was named by his parents as Pushka because he pushed for reforms. Okay, so at that time, he was not able to pinpoint one single reason as to why suddenly the coronary artery disease had gone up in uh, North Karelia because nobody knew what North Karelia stands for. So then he found out that during the World War, for the people who had participated, majority had participated, so they were given some freebies. So here we hear about freebies during the election time. There they were given after the war time. Okay, what were they given? So they were given free land, and they were given animals to graze. So they were given pork, and they were given sheep. So what they did was, they left their agricultural job, they started using these lands for the animals. So they started eating these animals. Dr. Sharang was pointing out exactly the story, and this has happened really, okay? So he found out that uh, this is the major cause for the rise in uh, the coronary artery disease, along with smoking and inactivity. So they did few things. And of course, the last slide of uh, Dr. Sharan, the, the last few slides, he said, taste is what matters. So because it's very difficult to change, but the petition, after all, came from them, okay? So they had to do something. So they formed an association called Martha Association. You can browse and see, the Martha Association is an association of women in that country. So. Dr. Pushka sat with those people to evolve strategies. The second strategy is what we wanted to have this afternoon, that was with the chefs, with the restaurants. People were really flourishing, so who will change? So without the knowledge of the consumers, the non-vegetarian product was reduced, and they started introducing something that tastes similar. So they had, what they had was mushrooms. So the mushrooms were added to the non-vegetarian product. So slowly, slowly things started changing. In restaurants, people were asked to give s salads free of cost, okay, to just increase the uh, consumption. Berries were available only seasonal. They sat with industries and made sure that it was available all through as frozen fruits. So small, small changes. People were given rewards to give up smoking. And passages were created for people to walk and cycle. So this is what happened. In the last four decades, things have changed dramatically. There is an 80% drop in the CAD. Uh, this is some story which I thought it's important to share. If you are teachers, I think you should spread it across to your students. That's, that's the most important thing. Vasha, I think I've told one story for now. Yeah. Sir, can atherosclerosis be reversed? Yeah. So this is the second thing which uh, I generally insist on. There are leaders, pioneers in this particular area. Okay, one is Dr. Dean Arnish, second is Dr. S. L. Stein. So you can also go through their uh, movies, books uh, on reversal of uh, atherosclerosis. So these two people have adopted whole food plant-based diet. There are minor differences between the two, and both of them have shown angiographic reversal. So it is still possible. And we have done a small study, but of course that was not based on angiogram, that was purely based on endothelial function assessment. So we had also hospitalized, uh, uh, we gave a hospitalized care to 30 members, 30 patients who had refractory cardiac symptoms, who had already undergone one procedure or other, like an angioplasty or a bypass surgery, but still continue to have symptoms. So we, ad we checked their endothelial function on day one of their admission and day 10 of their admission, following a whole food plant-based diet. All the <coughs> 30 had shown significant improvement on their endothelial function. And at six months, all of them had become asymptomatic. The only unfortunate thing is we didn't have a long-term follow-up because COVID came at that time and everybody had en I mean, ended up eating whatever they wanted. So we don't have a long-term follow-up. Thank you.
So this is the power of plant-based nutrition. You know that depth is useful both in treatment, prevention, and reversal as well of chronic diseases. No drug can be so powerful. You know, they say the bread, it works for coronary artery disease, which is the number one killer of, across the globe. Thank you, sir. Our next question is to uh, Dr. Suresh Bhagya. He is also working with cardiac patients because he's a cardiovascular surgeon. So we would like to ask you, sir, that can a plant-forward diet contribute to coronary artery disease and uh, what is your experience with cardiovascular disease and plant-based diet? So, uh, as we pointed out before that uh, nitrates, you know, would convert to nitrites and then nitrites will give rise to nitric oxide. And this reduces the inflammation as well as uh, reduces all the markers, biochemical markers in the body and improves the endothelial function. Also, and now there are some supplements which are available from plant extracts which can be used to reduce the cholesterol naturally like berberis and even uh, it's called like Arjun Kichal or like Arjun uh, tree bark. Also if you eat simply like green leafy vegetables like collard greens or like uh, arugula or kale or spinach or mint or coriander and uh, use it as a juice or even otherwise just chew it simply, the salivary amylase will convert it into nitrates and then nitric oxide which will reduce the inflammation, improve the endothelial function and actually reverse coronary disease. So even though I have done thousands of coronary bypass surgeries uh, all over the world, I have started now, you know, treating coronary disease with lifestyle medicine. That is like working on their sleep pattern or like social connections, stress, stress reduction or even dietary management. And I am getting very good results and people are extremely satisfied because they are prevented the major cut which uh, many cardiologists say that, uh, you know, it will be like a Hanuman Chati. So the patients are afraid and now they are no longer afraid because uh, they have a backup. So in those rare cases, 10% where we need to do surgery, uh, we have got a team of 50 cardiac surgeons, so we can refer them anywhere. And if not, then they go on to this simple path of reversal of cholesterol and reversal of heart blockages with simply diet and exercise and meditation. So there is a program in place and uh, we have started online also and people are really very happy and they get good results. So it is possible. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our next question is for Dr. Shefali Gupta. A lot of orthopedic doctors advise patients to drink milk for calcium and they also prescribe vitamin D supplement which is to be taken along with milk. What is your view on that? Milk actually uh, is, would give, uh, does give calcium and calcium would, uh, uh, has been known to be, uh, uh, in, in case we are deficient in, uh, um, in uh, calcium, then milk does help. But there have been studies which show that if you are okay, if, you, if your levels are okay or if the levels are higher, then calcium in fact does not help. There is something called diet dependent met metabolic acidosis, which means that uh, when we take animal food, the animal proteins make it uh, uh, result in the body to have the acidic pH and the calcium then is extracted from the bones which results in for buffering you know to get the pH normal so because of which the bones would actually be more deficient in calcium in case we go in for milk uh, milk based diet uh, or, or animal diet basically so uh, and the plant based foods are known to be very sufficient are enough 
for the requirement, our basic requirement is 70 milligrams to 2000 milligrams a day and that is very well covered by the amount of calcium that we get from green leafy vegetables or cruciferous vegetables and yeah. And, and, and arthritis or whenever the doctors or the orthopedic surgeons are, sub, are prescribing uh, calcium, then the inflammation anyways, uh, uh, the milk would only promote the inflammation and therefore it really doesn't help when you are, you know, when you have disease to have uh, a animal-based diet. So this is a question that... Yeah. So every time they Animal based. It depends on the quantity, the amount that you are having. Whenever because there is a change in pH. Yeah. So, there, there, so these, these are studies. This was done by Wallace in 2021, a very recent study. And, uh, and they are actually observational studies. They need more confirmation. But yes, there are the. But, one of but the but these more are important contributory factor may not be. It yeah. may not be a more yeah. body but calcium, yeah, which damages and causes yeah. the inflammation. The pH uh, no. change. Yeah. That is what you explained. No, the acidity load of uh, animal products is always on the higher side and uh, that does change the pH of the blood and the best buffer that the body can get is the calcium from the bones. So it's not like it's completely taking out all the calcium, but in small amounts it can be used. But calcium is extracted from the bone. But my question, there is so many times pH may be changed in the body. Does it mean that there is always an That is a proposed mechanism. That, that um, is a proposed yeah. mechanism, yeah. Madam, the, cal the yes. pH always has to be balanced. Yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree with you. Because these are all actually, as um, I mentioned in one of the slides, these are emerging areas where it is saying that acidic pH and leaching out of calcium and stuff. That is one part of the story. We still need more studies and um, the things to claim, to make these claims all right. But at the same time, what we need to understand that to get the enough calcium for our body, we don't necessarily need to completely depend on animal proteins. Looking at the kind of adverse effect it is going to give us, including take uh, uh, the dairy. Where are we getting dairy? Dairy we are not obtaining from the cow which is reared by a farmer in his house. It is mostly coming from industrial farming. Or, uh, you know, you have seen the industrial farming's effect uh, from Dr. Sharon's presentation. At the same time, in India, the, one of the most common food source of saturated fat, which we all know that saturated fat is inflammatory, it is also leading to LDL, atherosclerosis. That is predominantly coming from dairy. Not just because India is predominantly vegetarian nation, non-vegetarians are also consuming large quantities of dairy. So one is basically the saturated fat consumption, which is coming from whole fat dairy. Second is the kind of hormones and you know antibiotics and those kind of things which is coming from these uh, you know, uh, dairy products. And third is the kind of in, uh, climate related issues which is creating with this industry in place. So we need to look at these facts and take a decision. We are not saying that today cut off dairy completely. Because, you know, when you're making that transition, you also need to learn what are the other sources of calcium or proteins. If you're depending on calcium and protein, you're depending on dairy for calcium and protein. Learn that and start making the shift. We have done that. All of us sitting here have done that, actually. So calcium, one third recommended daily allowance, which is coming from dairy, 30% only, only it is bioavailable for us. Whereas there are some plant-based sources, which is 60, 70%. Yeah, that is, yeah, yeah, I, I totally, I, about calcium and pH and this all I, cycle, I, which is, you I, I totally to understand, that is an emerging area, which definitely needs more and more studies, it is something which is brought in, because most of the people don't discuss that, actually, so that is also an emerging area, which requires more studies, so what I'm saying is, start looking out for other calcium sources, other protein sources, Okay, you, when you're making that shift, let two or three servings of your calcium, two or three serving, two, two third part of the calcium initially come from uh, plant-based sources. 
plant based sources some of them have like 60 70% absorption yeah, we have exactly. done yes yeah. what was that almond and yeah see now sesame, sesame has 100 grams of milk would give you 120 mg of calcium 100 grams of sesame would give you 1600 mg of calcium uh, amaranth 100 grams will give you 330 mg of calcium all greens have the calcium what do you think the cow makes its calcium or gets its calcium the cow doesn't make or manufacture calcium on its own. It gets its calcium from the grass that it eats. So the more the green leafy vegetables that you eat, the more the calcium that you get. Second, what you have to remember is each milk is species specific. Uh, if you want to say that cow's milk has seven times more casein, this more of saturated fat, it is meant for the cow to double its weight in 40 days, to become 10 times its weight in six months. If you take a rat milk or cat milk, it will have 11 grams of protein per 100 ml. It is so high. You know, like uh, cow's milk is 3.3 grams of protein. Human milk is only 1.3 grams of protein per 100 ml. So that high protein is required for rapid growth. A rat will double its weight in four days. Okay. A cat will double its weight in, say, one month. A cow will double its weight in 40 days. A human being doubles its weight by three months or five months. So the each milk is species specific. That is what you have to understand. The question here was regarding calcium. You have to remember that we all need calcium. Milk is an important source. We don't deny that. But there are other plant-based sources. You have all green leafy vegetables. You have all legumes. Chickpeas, moong, chanya, chowli, all of them have calcium. Okay. And the study, the health professional study, follow-up study, which showed that teenagers drinking excess dairy had higher incidence of fractures in adulthood. So milk does not protect you from uh, osteoporosis. Okay, Countries which have the largest dairy consumption have the highest incidence of fractures at uh, senior citizens' age over time. It enhances osteoporosis. It does not reduce osteoporosis. That is. What is one more perception that we have? Milk uh, intolerance is very high. Milk leads to allergies, hormonal imbalances. It is linked to a lot of cancers. So when you choose, you have to choose wisely. Whether I choose that source of calcium from something which will have a lot of other adverse effects versus I choose it from a healthier source. Okay. My next question is Dr. Uh, to Dr. Amit Gupta. He's a pediatrician. So when you ask your uh, patients to uh, transit to a plant-based nutrition, what are the nutritional deficiencies or inadequacies which you foresee and how do you advise according to? Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, as such as we, we, we've seen in all the slides and all the presentations that plant-based diet is pretty self-sufficient. But a couple of things uh, I'll be worried of. One is the two vitamins, uh, vitamin B12, uh, which uh, is mainly from the animal sources. And another one is vitamin D, which we all know as a sunshine vitamin. Couple of trace elements which I'll be worried of, one is zinc and another one is iodine. Of course, all these things, we, we have fortified foods these days available. Uh, iodized salt is a good uh, source from where you can get your iodine. But these, these three, four things uh, would be uh, a, a cause of worry on an exclusive plant-based diet. Yeah. Uh, just a word about B12 here, because uh, yes, animal products do have B12, but the reason why they have is because the food that is given to these animals is fortified with B12. Uh, B12 basically comes from bacteria from the soil and now because of uh, all the pesticides that we use and the over hygiene that we follow cleaning everything spick and span uh, we are not consuming enough B12 and that goes across even non-vegetarians and uh, you know everybody has B12 deficiency issues. Uh, the animal industry, what it does is it feeds the B12, extra B12 to the animals and hence it is seed in the, instead of that we can directly consume the same B12 supplements ourselves. Yeah. Okay. So I think that answers this question which somebody has uh, sent. Yes? Yeah.
substantially people are found deficit in B12 and D. As you have already said, over hygiene and maybe some water over purifications and all. But regarding D, I probably observed that two of you are doing and following some fitness activity, maybe running and all. So this is little specific question I'm asking because athletes have extra demand and requirement of D. Because if they are deficient in D, they will end up with injuries. Musculoskeletal injuries are more prone in the athletes who have been associated if with low vitamin D level. So what is the connection? Why that requirement is extra when it comes to athletes? Myself, I am a competitive triathlete and uh, recreational triathlete with multiple uh, national medal holder in swimming. So I have already observed this thing and I am following veganism since four years by now. And, uh, but not strict vegan because I am, we are not following this lifestyle from a religious point of view. So, and if we become so strict, it becomes difficult to when we are traveling somewhere. So, chapati ke upar agar thoda sa ghi aa gaya hai that is perfectly all right. But I make sure that I'm milk free and I mean completely dairy free, as in when I'm practicing and living in my home. So, D3, I have been found deficient in 2020 when I was following my long distance endurance cyclist that was 600 kilometers and then I had a knee pain and I realized that orthopedic did not examine and he just said get the D3 check, D check and no need to come and just follow the prescription and I did. So since then I have what observed that whenever you are, any, if any person is associated with little more physical exertional activities the requirement of vitamin D and of course B12 is higher. What are the causes if you are already following the supplement protocol that it made it frequently at the deficit if not taken in supplements? Uh, I would, yeah. Uh, what were your levels if I may ask? Vitamin D3? At that time probably it was 10 or 12. And how did you improve them? That was with vitamin D3 uh, tablets. Tablets, no? Yeah. So you can just take that. Yeah, that vitamin. is what we yeah. do, huh. but since we are probably uh, discussing something at very micro level, I thought if I get the answer which I have yet not recovered from any sources. No, but your question is? Why it get okay. frequently so low in, there as is in? One thing we need to understand is the gut microbiota. We have changed it so much. Mexican dala, Italian dala, sab kuch hum dalte hai and it changes our gut microbiota. And that makes us also become deficient in lot of things. So also think about that factor. So that means ma'am, it is applicable for all? Yeah. Yes. See, vitamin D deficiency is found even in non-vegetarians. It is not only vegetarians. And uh, see, just now, even with sunlight exposure, because of ozone layer depletion, the UVB rays coming on our skin, the time of exposure, the area of exposure, everything matters. Okay. So vitamin D, if you're found deficient, you have to take supplements. There is no other way out. So the interesting part I share, while I was on that long distance cycling, the U-turn was at 300 kilometers. And probably we were riding throughout day and night. So sun exposure was enough. But, but yeah, that is what something is. Yeah, so even despite, it's not enough. For a few days or a few weeks, you know, it doesn't matter. It, it's not like that. It has to be continued. Vitamin D exposure, uh, not only, uh, it also depends how your skin texture is. It depends how it gets absorbed. It is not a one day uh, so, thing. It requires a long term exposure for three to four hours a day in a certain uh, time of the uh, uh, day. So, ma'am, so that means which probably only athletes must be exposed in a sunlight in the morning. No, no, that only for also one or two hours. Athletes max. also require. And yes. athletes require more because they use the muscles and bones more. Right. So, the requirement would be definitely more. So those guidelines which you have just described, probably nobody is, uh, will be fo following those guidelines of exposure in certain spectrum of light for certain hours, right? That must be the reason.
for in general frequent but, deficiencies? But because of the ozone layer also we can't prescribe that because uh, direct sunlight can of, uh, cause you the skin cancers also. So nowadays it is not possible because of the pollution, because of the ozone layer deficiency. So if we get the direct sunlight and if we ask the people just to go uh, and sit in the sunlight and maybe they uh, later on after a few years they may come with the skin cancers. They come uh, with uh, eye damage. We don't know. So that means there are certain deficiencies that we have yes. to mechanically supplement. Always there are certain B12 limitations, B12 I think. B12 and vitamin D will have to be supplemented. You need hey, to get uh, your levels. Depends, uh, my, being a national level athlete, uh, I, de I openly tell I am not taking any supplements. There is no B12 or D3 in my diet. There are no supplements. I follow, I am a naturopathy and yoga practitioner. We go based on elements. Like if you have the right elements, uh, my personal opinion, you need not to have any supplements. I mean, they have their own choice, but personally, I am not, I'm not taking any supplements and I am not seeing any deficiency. I am vegan for the past six years. I lived heavy. Uh, if milk was equal to calcium, my bones would have broken by now, right? And milk was whole food or protein. I wouldn't have won this many competition or have this kind of muscles. Everything is plant based. Like if you see yoga also, in Ashtanga Yoga, first is Yama and Niyama. In Yama, it comes Ahimsa, means you have to be non violent. So the first whoever practices yoga in Ashtanga, first is Yama, in Yama only, first is Ahimsa, means it is indirectly or directly they are telling whole food plant based. We have already discussed this is strongly related. First we are getting D2, D2 right? We are not convert, able to convert it into D3. This is all related our lifestyle since past few years and this uh, exposure of this uh, radiation and all many hazards creates impact and ultimately what we are eating not converting what we are getting and you sir athlete as because you are uh, aware since long yoga works on chakra and all that whatever you are eating you are getting in your blood and cellular level so it it's a lifestyle matter since uh, early age you are practicing that maybe you don't need that extra supplement but what we are uh, growing uh, nowadays i think we have uh, now we are on correct part so we need supplement i strongly believe because we yes. are not getting d3 from d2 yeah actually yes. Yes. yes in short if you are deficient better supplement yourself yes. okay if you are b12 deficient take b12 supplement if you are vitamin d is deficient take those supplement because B12 is made by bacteria, it is neither made by humans, nor by plants, and nor by animals. It is made by bacteria. If you harbor those healthy bacteria in your gut, they convert the food substrates into B12. But if you're deficient, take it. The next question goes to Dr. Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. I am naturopath Dhiren Sarin, and I have been practicing naturopathy since the last 16 years. I had many patients, thousands of them whom I have cured for B12 as uh, without any supplements, I would just, because a lot of the people, the doctors are sitting so they can also apply this in their own life. Sprouts is one of the most fundamental ways of increasing the microorganisms in your body which can produce this vitamin in your body. You don't have to eat any flesh for that. And at the same time, curd rice, you must have heard, you know, this is a very simple recipe. Just make curd rice. Mix rice with curd and keep it for four hours in your refrigerator. After four hours, take it out for one hour. Let it come back to the normal temperature and consume this. Within 15 days, anybody who's sitting over here has any problems regarding vitamin B12. If these two things are complied, and as uh, you know, uh, one of my friends who's sitting in the panelist is also a you know a naturopath. If you follow the five elements, agar wo pura kar diya jaye by taking a ideal diet which has got ample amount of fruits and uh, ample amount of greens. Because this green is the most important, this is the elixir on the planet Earth. If these two things reach our body, then 
two silent heroes, the roughage which works as a broom, and the second thing, water rich, 70% to 96% is all water rich. So, ye body ka detoxification under se, kyunki choshan ka system agar thik nahi hai, so even if you will follow what I have told you for B12 will not work for you. So you have to or else you can, you know, go to some naturopathy center and get yourself learned upon how we can treat our own self by cleaning our inner system with water. Just Thank with you. water. Thank by doing you. the Thank you. Thank you, by doing all Thank those activities. Thank you Anyways, so much. thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you so thank much. So this is a very insightful talk. We'll definitely incorporate these things into our studies and definitely will look out for evidence about it. You know, as uh, you mentioned, there are recently few studies which is coming up, which is saying that people with uh, good bifidobacterium and some other bacterium in the colony bacteria don't have, don't face vitamin B12 deficiency in the ab absence of animal product. But it is again an emerging field. We need more studies on that. So as we all know that we believe in evidence-based nutrition, we need to we claim something, we need to put it for testing. It's not, should, it shouldn't be one of its case. Anecdotal evidence with three people, four people, it has to be widely accepted. We will, we, we are getting into that. And thank you so much for the suggestion. There are emerging uh, things, studies coming up. And for athletes, or we consider people like you as special population, pregnancy, some of these kind of conditions, it's always better believe in the current science. If there is deficiency, as Dr. Varsha said, definitely we need uh, supplementation. So other things, until unless it is proved, especially with the special populations, we should not be going ahead with anything, um, other stuff actually. So uh, there is deficiency, please correct it. Also understand, it's high time that we create a food system which is uh, devoid of this cruelty and also this exploitation of any kind and create something which is good for us to thrive, to thrive, to, to, to be performing at our highest potential. If it is, if it is need to be given some fortification or some supplementation, let's not be too uh, rigid with that actually. Sometimes this supplementation will help us to uh, perform at our best and without causing any nutritional deficiencies. Or adapting our lifestyle, as he said, if it is proven, let's take that path. Don't be rigid in any of those things, actually. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Ashwat Kumar. Uh, he's a vegan bodybuilder, whole food plant-based. And the question is that, sir, with plants, generally the perception is that uh, your body gets weaker and your performance drops. What is your take on that? Six years back, uh, I was also into typical uh, a gym guy mindset uh, where uh, I was vegetarian from birth, uh, thank God for that. But uh, trainer used to tell, you need to, since you're not taking meat, you need to eat a lot of paneer, drink milk, uh, one liter milk, take a lot of whey proteins. So this is the mindset I had and I used to take this. I couldn't see any changes. Instead, my fat started growing and I used to feel bloating always, lethargic, fatigue, certainly. I didn't see the results. No results, it was full of fatty. Then I switched to plant-based by seeing some documentaries, understood what's going on behind the uh, cruelty part like Dr. Sharan showed in the slides. So these things struck my mind. Instantly, I switched to plant-based. That's when I could see the changes in my body. Then I took it to the next level, just to not make myself proud, just to tell the world that with plant-based diet, what you can achieve. I started competing then, because I could see the gradual changes. I started competing with the enhanced shows. Enhanced one is where people take steroids and all, all other stuffs. So there I started, I started with meaning Mr. Bangalore, Mr. Karnataka, Mr. South India, Mr. India last year, then I went to Mr. Asia in Delhi two months back, then last last month I competed, I represented India in Thailand and I was the first uh, plant-based bodybuilder to win two silver medals for India. So the government sponsored, so in my jacket also you can see Team India Bodybuilding. So it is not required, so that's what I am here to tell. 
people when they say gym or muscles they equate it to whey proteins milk and chicken that's what comes in mind right gym muscles equals chicken people always ask me how many eggs you eat right this is the common question i ask if i tell i'm plant based or vegan not many will understand if the understand also tell from where do you get proteins from like as ma'am mentioned it's all microbial activities right we have around one and half kgs of microbes in our body like earlier if you go i'm from south so we had this tradition of ambali fermentation in north you call us kanji right so that is what fixes your absorption so you are eating you are getting sunlight you are eating lot of b12 food but still why there is no absorption because there is no microbial activity there microbes to break it down so that's the reason you might be deficient so it's a holistic one again so please try at least for a month if you are athlete if you are going to gym or doing yoga try for a month and see the changes certainly it will improve as i also told if anybody practicing yoga or into yoga sana if you you need to start from ashtanga yamani asana pranayam pranayara dhyana dharana samadhi eight limbs the first limb is yama in yama first is ahimsa which is plan based you can't directly go to third step that's the reason patanjali has return asana is in the third step right first is yama do's and don'ts everything has a rules right to enter the city we have certain rules which, which has been laid out by the government we can't break the rules so similar way do's and don'ts then come to asana yeah for me definition yoga of yoga is what you do outside the mat not on the mat isn't it because that's just asana it's a drop in the ocean so first step is ahimsa so ahimsa means obviously be equal to all whether it's animal or your neighbor or your friend or your parents isn't it so that is what it is so absolutely i could see lot of changes certainly you can all my humble request just for a month start doing it and see the changes thank you so much thank you so much for that answer um, my next question is to, uh, to dr neetu parekh uh, a lot of people in the audience might have a question about proteins when we ask people to change to plant based nutrition what is the uh, how do we get our protein what is the difference in quality between animal and plant protein and is it adequate or not uh proteins as such we know that it is a requirement of the growth development repair of the body uh first of all uh, i would like to say that uh, proteins has actually 22 types of amino acids out of them uh, nine are the essential amino acids which are actually not produced by our body we have to be it has to be given from outside uh so if we differentiate first of all between the animal protein and the plant protein uh they tell that the animal protein as such is a complete protein which has a nine essential amino acids which the plants do not have it at present they say only one that is a uh, quinoa is a uh, considered to be the complete uh, protein which has a nine amino acids excuse so, me madam i yeah. would just like to interrupt now it has been proved beyond doubt that all plants have all 20 essential amino acids including the nine essential amino acids but this study was done from yeah. by dr christopher gardner from stanford okay. where each and every plant right from rice to wheat to cauliflower to uh, whatever you name it every plant each leaf has or each cereal would have every of those 20 essential amino acids in uh, 20 amino acids including the nine essential amino acids the proportion may be varying yeah the proportion may vary sometimes the all amino acids, acids are not there but Sulfur all amino acids are not there that is they all have all 20 okay. and all nine essential are present in each and every plant okay so the thing is uh, all plant proteins have complete protein that is Done. for sure yeah so it's it's more like this that uh, rice will have all amino acids but couple of amino acids it will have in lesser amount so if you eat only rice yes so you have to eat some diet then yeah. those two amino acids you will be a little deficient in 
but we nobody eats only rice if you exactly. combine it with dal dal will have exactly those amino acids in high amount and two others which will be in lower quantities so when you have a complete diet like we say always eat the rainbow you have to eat all kinds of food products and then you will completely get all amino acids that was i was trying that you have to mix and match the uh, proteins of the plants rather in uh, suppose if we go for the animal proteins uh, that is only the one plus point for that that you can get the proteins in in one product only so that was i was coming with so you have to mix and match the proteins plant proteins so that is the only negative point so if i take for the animal proteins why we should avoid it because it as we said that the the body requires everything so it only contains the protein it it contains the saturated fat it does not contains the fiber so it uh, it has got a very high risk for the cvd cv strokes uh, heart diseases right so uh, secondly the as he said that the animal proteins uh, uh, that uh, the requirement uh, to make the dairy products or for the red meats uh, five times the water is been utilized for example if you make a plant protein 300 uh, liters are utilized then this will utilize around 1500 liters so the water is uh, ecological system is also going to affect it secondly for making the animal proteins they rec- a lot of biogases uh, are produced like greenhouse gases which are uh, for example hfc that is hydrofluorocarbons which are environmental non friendly right uh, so the plant proteins are now considered i i would put it that they are really good not only they have a, a, all the amino acids as you said but they have a anti inflammatory pro, uh, 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 thing they have anti cancerous property for example you can take kale so which is a green veg uh, for example flax seeds also have a certain things which are now considered as an anti cancers secondly it can uh, anti aging uh, uh, pro, uh, properties do uh, they have it uh, also they uh, some of them have a very good fatty acids and more of them it has got a good fibers so along with the proteins we are getting fibers also which will yeah. help to decrease the cholesterol which is the most important thing at, at present exactly. so the animal proteins uh, would be of course a better choice uh, if everybody agrees to it yeah sure so what you have to remember is see the protein excess protein is harmful protein is required for what growth and repair okay so if what happens to the excess protein have you ever thought of it fat is stored as fat carbohydrate is stored as glycogen excess carbohydrate is stored as fat what happens to the excess protein in the body what happens it's very demanding on the body to convert that excess protein into fat and then it is converted into uric acid and then you have gout and then you have so excess protein is a uh, industry created hype you know whether it is what we protein that is given is actually is a waste of cheese production you know when cheese was produced jab hum ghar pe paneer banate hai that way if you dehydrate it it becomes whey protein powder okay that's highly acidic i've had gym uh, young gymers who presented with renal stones consuming excess proteins okay so excess protein is definitely not good so the next question is i would uh, like to add it that the whey proteins uh, they also say nowadays that if you take an excess whey proteins they are known to produce cardiac arrhythmias and death okay. so the whey so protein should be taken uh, uh, in a limited yeah, so now amount we have tata come out with a plant based protein you have pea protein you have rice protein so if you really need additional protein you can go for that the next question comes to dr sharan regarding soy protein there are lots of myths regarding soy protein so what is your view on that so uh, soy protein is actually uh, a very uh, excellent source of uh, proteins not only that it has also got uh, both the essential uh, fatty acids as well and uh, it is a major competitor to the uh, animal uh, industry you know and that is why it will time and again they bought into disrepute uh, because they don't want it to get promoted uh, in fact um, the major advantage of like we were just discussing animal versus plant we have to look at the package even dr gr mentioned that animal proteins animal products will have tmao it will have heterocyclic amines it will have neo5gc 
these are all highly inflammatory molecules known to increase inflammation lead to ca cancers they are also teratogenic and they are known to cause myocardial toxicity and even neurotoxic now these are all products which will come along with the proteins what we we are only focusing on one thing like in milk to we are focusing on calcium you can't just have calcium from milk you have to have the entire product and all the bad effects that come with it similarly for proteins you can't just have protein from animal products you have to take all the bad things that also come along with it while plants will have what are known as antioxidant elements now these in uh, soy proteins are isoflavones okay also known as phytoestrogens okay they act similar to estrogen but they are not as strong as estrogen so depending on the phase like in women suppose in a uh, premenopausal uh, stage where uh, estrogen is high in the body it will taper down the effect of estrogen on the other hand in postmenopausal stage where estrogen is they are deficient and hence have problems it will act like a mild estrogen and mitigate the postmenopausal symptoms so soy isoflavones are an excellent source and excellent nutrition uh, they have benefits uh, they have known to reduce the hdl uh, reduce the L, uh, ldl cholesterol increase the hdl they known to have protection against cardiovascular disease and stroke they have known to have protection against breast cancer endometrial cancer even prostate cancer they have uh, excellent effect on bone increasing the bone density now the problem is that these isoflavones will uh, get removed if you process the product too much like we also get soy protein powders right but that soy protein powder is processed so much that all the isoflavones have been removed so the benefits are coming from these isoflavones not just from the protein so if you have soy you should have it as much as in the whole form as possible without too much of processing and the other fear that is there is about uh, you know effect of that phytoestrogen in men there is an effect that it may have caused gynecomastia and things like that but like i said it is a very mild form it in fact blocks the natural action of estrogen so in fact it has anti estrogenic properties if at all so those are also unwarranted uh, myths and fears that have been uh, brought up thank you sir for that clarification i am sure a lot of people thinking about consuming soy uh, would have got a little more clarification especially regarding uh, the consumption in men one one other thing i would like to point out is the amount usually two servings per day is considered sufficient it's absolutely safe to have two servings of soy in a day and it is additional more than that is also not shown to be of any benefit so up to two servings in a day that roughly you can say 25 to 30 grams of protein per day coming from soy is safe and sufficient both so now we what may enjoy our about the tofu yes yeah uh, all inclusive whatever you whatever take whatever you take ha uh, soy in any form soy, soy except uh, soy so powder so in the tofu does the, do you think that the nutritional value is decreased marginally not too much not too much not too much so we can all enjoy our tofu scramble yes sir so this question goes to all the panelists and what your experience or your thoughts are on this because you are talking of soy which is not our uh, native food our genetic machinery uh, machinery is designed from our ancestry to digest a certain kind of protein or whatever nutrients we are taking in so when we are exposing ourselves you know the world being a very liberal world and a very open world we are exposed to mexican italian japanese everything so what happens to our genetic machinery i'm i'm pretty sure it it's kind of very confused so what is your view because we are going to face this we are going to become more open and everything is going to be more this so it has its good effects and bad effects what is your view on this because uh, the same issue is happening you know with our uh, with uh, diabetes where we talk about your genetic machinery is not used to the capitalistic economy that we are into it we are flooded with nutrients so we really can't handle it and everything just goes into a liver or into fat cell and store it there so, so what same yes, way for so soy also or same way for anything i mean i don't eat pasta 
since my childhood when I became 40 I first ate pasta so what happens to that pasta that I've eaten so yes, essentially so the difference between the milieu exterior and the milieu interior how does the body handle it? what's your view your experience on this yes so local is the best but uh, when we are talking about transition when we are when somebody is uh, having dairy daily or having non vegetarian food daily transition is important and because taste buds do take some time so these alternatives help in transition and uh, uh, they are rich sources of protein like soy for soy so best is to have local that is that would be the best as you say the milieu exterior and the milieu interior so that is where best is the local excuse See, me yeah no this is this is what we discuss in our fraternity is a, one is genotype one is phenotype so what you are talking about is what's the effect of all this thing on our genotype but obviously it is affected uh, if we see, you know, current world IDF atlas also, and uh, it says that being South Asian, being Indian, we are carrying a higher risk at birth for developing uh, this Asian. metabolic syndrome and all its manifestation like diabetes, hypertension, ASCVD, whatever, right? We are developing the disease at early age. We are developing the complication faster. And this all in spite of if you have heard you know that why why paradox we are having at birth higher fat percentage this is all because of our genotype so you are right this all has affected our genotype and that has resulted in phenotype which we called as a we are a thin fat indian but now if we want to change if we will implement today the genotype may be changed in after decades but yes we need to start it so it's like you know it doesn't mean that i am doing a whole plant-based diet and i will change my genotype no no i it's it's not going to be benefit only me but if we'll continue in the legacy yeah i may get the result in successive generations so that's what uh, it's affect it, it is affecting that's true also uh, the point of eating the local i mean for example kiwi fruit has become local but it is no way native to us so, I mean, the lines are blurring. That's what I want to say. And have, we, have there been any studies looking at this impact, you know, of going beyond the native food, what impact it has on our health? I don't think there are any studies to that effect. At least I'm not aware of. So it will be difficult to practically implement that with, uh, you know, the cities becoming so cosmopolitan and, uh, you know, what is local, who is local <laughs> is also a big question. So I think it's a little challenging, but uh, we need to go step by step. I think the first, there's enough data to suggest that the animal products have to be cut out. And that is the first step we take. Then, of course, you can think of local and then we can think of even native things. So it's a process. I think we have to go step by I, step. Excuse me, I just would like to add one thing. See, uh, there was no tea grown in India before the Britishers came. Exactly. Okay, the Britishers brought tea as a gift. What happened because of that? Uh, before the pre-British era, one lakh varieties of rice were grown in India. What was done as a monocrop, wheat and tea, and that was all exported during the World War and all. So that changed our biodiversity of our uh, land also. And then, uh, of course, we lost those you know, one lakh varieties of rice that we used to grow. And uh, that now we have, you know, polished rice or white rice, one type. And it's proven that the magnesium content in all this rice is so less and one of the reasons for high blood pressure. That was one of the research papers that I had read. So this definitely has an impact. I'm not saying it does not have an impact. But slowly, if we eat local, and as far as soybean goes, sir, soybean has been grown in our country since the pre-British era because Madhya Pradesh is a state where maximum soya bean is grown. And uh, I, know a uh, like I know families who have been growing soya bean for more than three generations over there. The variety is small size as compared to what we get. The only thing is we don't have to have a GMO variety, which is uh, very difficult. You know, it's very toxic for the body as well, having GMO foods. I just wanted to add on. I don't have a direct answer to your question uh, because none of us are prepared for that. Uh, nutrition is a vast ocean and it's not going to be easy. That is why most of the guidelines have moved away from individual products to a plate. 
So it's better not to talk about what is uh, uh, protein, uh, what is vitamin B12, what is vitamin D, whether the soya is good, whether the tea is good. Instead, you put everything on a plate and see whether the plate is good. That's the only point which we have now. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of research in India. So that is going to make a huge difference. That is what every one of us should strive for. And uh, as was pointed out, uh, the effect on genotype is not something which you're going to make out in this era. I mean, our era. Exactly it's going to be something which we'll make out only yeah. for the, our uh, future generation. Yeah. So also the research that's going on in nutrition and what has been presented is a very analytical research. We need to have a much more organic because what yoga says about its diet, like combining two foods might have a completely different impact. So we'll have to kind of look at it much more organically. Yes, uh, Doc, actually, thank you for all your suggestions. We will uh, incorporate whatever we have received uh, in this thing uh, for our uh, research studies and further analysis and all. I do agree with uh, you that we, in, especially in India, we need to have a holistic approach. One part of it is analytics, and as the uh, doctor said, uh, we need to have that pattern part. Everything will be included, but we should not be restricting ourselves. Oh, it is not there. It is not our kind of a diet, so we should not do it. Whatever available evidence we have, we need to start incorporating so that our generation gets better, next generation gets better, and we have more and more studies coming in. We will incorporate those things, and I think we should. <laughs> One, one last question because uh, I think uh, the audience might be interested in this. This is regarding diabetes prevention and reversal. And Dr. Manisha Shah and Dr. Dharmendra uh, have been actively managing diabetes uh, uh, on plant-based nutrition. So uh, uh, this question is uh, targeted to both of them. So Dr. Manisha, if you would like to start. If you can repeat the question, sorry. About uh, uh, diabetes reversal and prevention of diabetes on plant-based diet. Yeah, fine. Uh, diabetes reversal, of course, it's possible on whole plant-based diet. You know, uh, one thing, the question which I usually encounter upon is, uh, Doc, if you are going to give whole plant-based nutrition diet, this is what you are going to give high carb to your patient and does it affect the sugar? But here, what we need to see as a whole, as also, you know, Dr. Saran also uh, put in his slide, two beautiful properties of whole plant-based nutrition for my diabetes reversal, which I look is, one is high fiber, and second is low calorie density. These are the two beautiful property which makes this whole plant-based diet eligible, or as I would say, one of the best way to get uh, your diabetes on the reverse. Uh, Actually, to specify the term, as again it was discussed, it's not reversal, let me say, it should be the remission. Uh, that's what we mean to say. But here the concept of reversal, whenever we start, we, we talk to our people with diabetes, it must be in their mind. Let me simplify it. If I am at Ahmedabad, I want to go to the Mumbai, and I'm going from Surat to Mumbai, and I'm coming back to even Surat, that means I have reverse. So, reversal doesn't mean cure, that should be first of all in our mind and remission means off medication. So, this, with this clear concept, if we implement whole plant-based nutrition diet, of course, we can get diabetes reversal, but everybody with diabetes is not eligible for diabetes reversal. Here is the second part which we used to say bluntly to our people with diabetes. Because if you want to drive Ferrari, you need to have that capability, you need to have the license to drive the Ferrari. You can't just, you know, have the keys and go and drive the Ferrari. So I mean to say, a person who is having diabetes since 15 years, who is having atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, who has developed one MI, who has, a, you know, a stent in there, who has mild cardiovascular dysfunction, who has developed some other peripheral vascular disease, even if they are, they can, by medical professor, we would like to keep them on some treatment for the prevention. So that is what the other aspect we, we look for. So that is, you know, we need to pick up the person earlier in the earlier phase of diabetes and if we can put upon, definitely we can get that. And that's what we, we say, you know, our aim uh, for the diabetes reversal, remission or diabetes freedom, whatever terminology we use, it's to give a 
good quality of life with diabetes with minimum less or no medication whatever is possible thank you so much that gives a little clarity thank you everybody yeah. i'll add one more point is the inflammation which is also very important cause for the diabetes especially insulin resistance so it's not only the whole food plant based diet jaise gaadi ke char pahiye hai agar ek e pahiya hum achhi hawa se chalayenge aur baaki ke din mein kuch garbad hai to nahi chalne wala hai usi tarah diabetes ke liye bhi char pahiye hai whole food plant based diet exercise स्ट्रेस एंड मेडिकल सो चारों को लेके चलना है तो पॉसिबिलिटी ज़्यादा है सो नाउ माई लास्ट क्वेश्चन ऑफ द सेशन टू डॉक्टर कौशल सर इज़ अ गैस्ट्रोन्ट्रोलॉजिस्ट सो दिस इज़ अबाउट गट डिस बायोसिस सो सर थ्रो सम लाइट ऑन प्रोसेस प्रोसेस फूड एंड अल्ट्रा प्रोसेस फूड एंड प्लान बेस्ड डाइट i think uh, today there is enough light uh, so we are not now much more enlightened about this food and everything but this gut dysbiosis is very much uh, talked for last 20 years uh, uh, anyone knows what is the best source of vitamin b12 or highest source of vitamin b12 water water water, water. and that water is polluted water and not the refined water so uh, once we started all these refined things we started having diseases so what is the largest factory of b12 our own large bowel large colon uh, we make the highest amount of b12 ourselves we cannot use it because it is not absorbed from colon it is absorbed from the small intestine so we make b12 for others how by defecating so there is very simple so uh, everyone said absolutely right uh, sir said sir said that follow the natural course and then you won't have any deficiency you won't have any problems these microbiomes we have 3 into 10 raised to 13 microbes in our body 10 raised to 13 means 1 trillion what is trillion he uh, he he explained very well what is trillion so we have 3 into uh, 10 raised to 13 microbes in our body and we have 20 100 genomes in our body which is uh, and microbes have 150 times more genomes than our own body cells so microbes they control us we do not control our microbes and food controls our microbe thank so you so whatever food you take your microbes uh will change and that microbe will control your whole body not only one type of health disease everything and that is probably the today's uh, uh, uh probably message yeah uh, so that's what i yeah. i tried to give so i just had one, one I small had, uh, point uh apes uh, practice what is known as corpophagy eating the excreta of their own no no and now, now we have now, now we have a sophisticated name sophisticated names. stool uh, <laughs> transplantation fecal, which is fecal transplant 70000 rupees yes so uh, getting some other one stool into your all own body will uh, take, uh, will uh, we will charge 70000 rupees yeah okay. that's called fecal medical transplant sir, sir, and the is one of the uh, fmt yeah. and so, uh, thank you everybody so we have seen that the food on your plate either fights disease or feeds disease and we have a lot of questions from the audience i request you to put it into that uh, pan ahmedabad group on whatsapp all those questions will be answered uh, all are uh, we have butterflies in our stomach we are all hungry so everybody can enjoy a whole food plant based meal outside and we request you to become members of pan different groups whether it is uh, learning as a part of discussion forums jo journal clubs or being ambassadors for pan and i request the panelists to be there on stage for a photograph group photograph thank you thank you so much